Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for being here. If I got my numbers right, we're looking at week number six. And boy, I got to tell you, I'm ready to get back in the swing of things. And with that is some great news. And that is that on Sunday, May the 3rd, we're going to get back into our services and open up at least our 1030 worship service. Of course, we're going to be maintaining uh, good social distancing. Uh, you won't be able to sit anywhere you'd like to. We're going to have some of the sections blocked off to try to keep for that safe uh, distancing and personal space between each other. But I hope you'll come and join us uh, on that day. It's going to be a great opportunity just to be able to come together again as a church family. And uh, I know I've been missing that, and I'm sure you have been as well. But in the in meantime, I hope that these little messages, these uh, the videoing of the messages have been a blessing to you. And so we're going to dive right in again. Uh, we started last week on a series that is going to be on recalculating. You know, we're in a time right now where we're recalculating. We're in a time where every single day it almost feels like that I'm readjusting. And it's kind of like the uh, GPS unit in your car. It's kind of like that unit that uh, when you're going somewhere that you don't know where you're going and you're traveling down the road and maybe you miss a turn and all of a sudden that navigation system begins to make those famous words of recalculating where it's trying to adjust and to get you uh, the safest path back on track to where you're supposed to be going. And so we've been kind of looking at this idea and this understanding of recalculating and how do we adjust ourselves to uh, fit to get back on track with God's plan and what God's purpose is and uh, what is it that we're doing through all of this process. And we find ourselves, if you're like me, recalculating a lot here, especially over these last several weeks. And so in order for us to understand that, though, we've been looking at God's word in certain aspects or ways. And an example of that would be last week where we looked at James and James illustrates for us a young man wealthy young man, has a lot going on, uh, has all these masses of wealth, and he decides, you know what, I just need to destroy my barn. Uh, I can't keep all my stuff in this barn, so I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to build a bigger barn, and I'm going to be merry, and I'm going to drink, and I'm going to be happy, and it's going to be great. And James says that in this illustration, that mentality was a foolish mentality because the man's life was going to give an account of. In other words, that night, that later that day, later that evening, he was going to be called into the presence of the Lord. And so his priorities were all out of whack. And so James helps us see in that little illustration how important it is to recalculate so that our priorities are right. So that the things that we know are important and of value and are worth uh, are going to be a part of who we are and how we're living our lives. And so we recalculated. And so much like that, we're going to look today in the Old Testament. We're going to look today in the Old Testament as another illustration and understanding of a young man that was recalculating another situation where he had to stop and to think. And much like that rich young uh, man that we talked about last week illustrates you and I, so does this next young man. It's actually an Old Testament minor prophet. And so I want you to go back into the Old Testament. If you've got the Word of God, I want you to pull it out because we're going to examine the prophet Habakkuk. And so in Habakkuk, we have, uh, it's the end of the Old Testament. It's only three chapters long. It's a small, what we call minor prophet. And, uh, and so I want you to go there. So go to the middle of your Bible, find Matthew, and then turn to the left. And you'll go several books back in. And all of a sudden, you're going to come to this little three-chapter book called Habakkuk. And uh, we really don't know a lot about Habakkuk. <clears throat> There's not much that we know uh, about who he is. Uh, we know a little bit. We know about the circumstances that were surrounding him. We don't have a lot of data on his life personally. But let me tell you what we do know is kind of an introduction, uh, if you would. And then we're going to kind of walk through this book. Habakkuk's a minor prophet, and his concern really was with the Babylonians. Now, the Babylonians was a dominant force and power in that day. They rose quickly to power. Uh, they were a force to be reckoned with, and they conquered a number of uh, states, if you would, a number of territories and people groups. And so they really were vicious and they rose to power quick. And we find that this nation Judah here is going to see the Babylonians come in and do a great swift uh, act of justice in God's eyes, not necessarily Habakkuk's when he was dealing with certain things. And so these Babylonians were coming in. And so he's prophesying during this time period. 
And so the Babylonians is that main part there. If you start out, you will see uh, Habakkuk kind of sees, well, really not Habakkuk, more than Judah sees on three different occasions from 605 B.C. all the way to 586 B.C., Three different swift accounts of the Babylonians coming in and conquering. The Assyrians were of the first that they conquered. Then the Egyptians uh, were subject to the Babylonians. We also see where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel was taken into captivity uh, by Babylon. All of that taking place in that 612 uh, B.C. all the way down to 586 B.C. And so Habakkuk is prophesying. He's this minor prophet that's going to share this message to the people of Judah. And when the book opens up, Habakkuk is really frustrated. He's, uh, he's confused. And so we're going to kind of chronicle this book and see how it relates to you and to me in this idea and understanding of recalculating. So go to that book, Minor Prophet Habakkuk, because we're going to pick up uh, in chapter number one. And the first thing I want you to see as we chronicle this is Habakkuk's frustration, his confusion, if you would. Let's pick up our reading now, starting in verse number two of chapter one. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And will you not hear me? Even cry out to you violence, and you'll not save. Why do you show me iniquity? And cause me to see trouble. For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arising. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteousness. Therefore preserved judgment proceeds. Notice what's seen here. Habakkuk is expressing concern for this situation. He's this small little minor prophet and he's reaching out, he's ministering, and he's going to see all of these things unfold that God's going to tell him really right before his eyes. And he's frustrated and he's concerned and you can see, you can hear the text, the frustration that he has. For example, uh, he uses terms like, how long will I cry out, but yet you won't hear me? You cause me to see trouble and plunder and violence. Those are very descriptive terms to how Habakkuk was being frustrating and confused as to what was taking place. He's looking around and he's seeing violence and, and plundering and he's seeing that this nation of Judah is going to be frustrated and it's going to be taken into captivity. And all of these things are frustrating to him. He screams out with confusion, much like you and I. You and I are frustrated right now. We're sitting here trying to figure out how we're recalculating our lives. In fact, we're doing it on a daily basis. We're now in this part and when uh, the country is going to decide whether or not to open up and in what phases do we open up and how quickly do we open up. And so every single day we're recalculating. And you know what? If you and I were honest with ourselves, we'd have to say it's a sense of frustration. Because every single person has a mindset and an understanding as to what's important and what needs to be done. In fact, I'd venture to say that every single body in the whole country has a plan to open up the country and none of it's the same. Because we all have this mentality, this idea. And so here Habakkuk is, he's frustrated because he's seeing this thing that he doesn't understand. He quite can't figure out what it is that God's doing. And he says, how long do I have to cry out and you don't hear me? I'd venture to say that there's been several of us who made that same plea. That same plea as we cried out to God and say, Why, God? Why in the world? How long is this going to go on? What is it that's happening? And yet it doesn't seem to be that we're getting an answer. It doesn't seem that with our pleading and our arguing that we're seeing God do something. But let me just tell you that you're not alone in Habakkuk's frustration, much like your own. There's other individuals we see time and time again in Scripture where people cried out and they pleaded with God. A perfect example of that is the life of Job. Now you remember the story well and, and the account in God's Word. Satan has been given permission to do whatever he wants to God's servant Job. Because God knows that Job is going to stay true to him. And so boy the, the devil begins to work old Job over. He begins to really just throw every single thing at him. He lost his family, he lost his farm, he lost his cattle. Time and time again, he just began to strip everything away from Job. To test Job, because he just knew if I took everything away from Job, Job's going to curse God. But yet Job was true. But even in the midst of that truth, you know what Job did? He still questioned. He still wondered. In fact, in Job chapter 13, verse number 3, you'll find these words, But I speak to the Almighty 
that I desire to reason with God. Even Job said, man, I just, want to, I just want to ask God. I just want to reason with him. I want to try and figure out what it is that's happening and why is this happening to me. Oh, God, I love you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm true to you. And when you try me, I'm going to come forth as gold. But that doesn't mean I don't understand. That doesn't mean that I don't want to cry out and reason with God. Even Job made that plea. And so I don't want you to think if you're the guy or you're the gal that's sitting around right now and going, you know what, man, sometimes I'm just questioning what in the world's going on. I'm questioning what God is doing. You're not alone in that. Others have done the same thing, and I myself have done the same thing, in which I wonder, God, I don't really know what in the world is going on, and I can't quite figure it out. And because of my own sinful nature, it requires me to recalculate based upon the circumstances that God has us in at this particular time. And so see that frustration. And so Job pours his heart out to God in this idea and understanding of frustration. And with that then comes God's response. It's really the Lord's plan, if you would, beginning in verse number 5. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your day which you'll not believe, though it were told to you. For indeed, I'm rising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadths of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. And they are terrible and dreadful, and their judgment and their dignity proceeds from themselves. I want you to stop for a minute. Here Habakkuk is, and he's frustrated, and he says, Lord, I just don't know what's going on, and how long am I going to have to cry? And then all of a sudden, God responds to him, and his plan is that I'm, you're going to be utterly astounded. You're going to be amazed at what's going to happen, and I'm going to do this great work, and it's going to be so great that you're not even going to believe it, even though I'm telling you. But then his plan is, I'm raising up these Chaldeans. I'm raising up this nation that's going to come down. They're a wicked group of people. They're terrible. And they're going to come down and they're going to punish Judah. The justice that I have for Judah is going to be seen by raising up this nation that's a wicked people. That wasn't much of a plan at all, right? In Habakkuk's eyes, in our, in our sinful way, we look at that and go, wait a minute, what in the world is God doing? How could this possibly be? And so here Habakkuk is, he's pleading with God, and when God answers, it's going to be astounding, it's going to be amazed, and I would venture to say, if I could kind of go back into the heart of Habakkuk, he would probably say, oh yeah, I'm astounded, all right. <laughs> this makes no sense whatsoever that you're going to bring these wicked people down and they're going to punish us. That makes no sense, but yet you're not even going to believe it. God says to him, even though I'm going to tell you this is what's happening. And of course, because of that, what does Habakkuk do? He does what you and I would have done and probably still do today, and that is he begins to complain. So Habakkuk has a complaint at what God has just shared with him. And that complaint really jumps over to verse number 12. So verse number 12 of chapter 1 says, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? You shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment, O Rock. You have marked them for correction. Your pure eyes, then they behold evil. I cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devour a person more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no rule over them? They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their nets. They gather them in their dragnets, and therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to their nets, the burn incense to their dragnets because of their share of sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their nets and continue to slay nations without pity? You sense that frustration. You sense that complaint, right? See, Habakkuk doesn't like God's plan. Habakkuk does not like what God is getting ready to do. And he's challenging that. And now, I don't think that Habakkuk is being sinful here. I don't think it's disrespectful to really question at times what God is doing. However, how we respond to that message can be sinful. And Habakkuk's like, I don't understand this. Look at these wicked people. That how can you bring a more wicked person the blessings and the spoils of conquering another nation when that other nation has to be more righteous than they? 
And you know, we could argue the same thing today, can't we? We can argue the situation and the circumstance we find ourselves in, and we go, wow, you know what, this just doesn't make sense. This is a terrible idea. I don't know why in the world we're going to do that or, or this. And, you know, we have all this other stuff. I was listening to the press conference with the governor, and he made the comment about being careful about not categorizing what is an essential role or person's job versus non-essential because to the person working that job it's essential to him right and so we have all these ideas swirling around and we tend to jump at each other and sort of uh, bite back and lash out and more and more you see the rudeness of people when we really need to be seeing the kindness of people uh, when it comes to situations like this and circumstances and we look back and go wow wait a minute you know what all of these people and what they have or don't have, and all of a sudden we begin to take our eyes off of what's ultimately important. And we don't understand what God is doing. And we can't grasp it. And a lot of times it may mean that it's going to be, in our eyes, something that's worse than what God's intention is for us. And we have to be careful and we have to be cautious in that. And Habakkuk, boy, he is complaining and he's frustrated over God's plan. For this nation of Judah. But listen to what God then commands. And that's going to move us into chapter number 2. I'm going to skip verse number 1 of chapter 2. We're going to come back to that one. But I want to start our reading to see this command that God gives him in chapter 2. Verse number 2. And then the Lord answered to me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets. That he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. I will not tarry. Though the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Indeed, because the transgression uh, transgressed by wine, he is a proud man and he does not stay at home. Because he enlarges his desire as hell and he is like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself a nation and heaps upon himself all people. Now notice this command that God has given to Habakkuk. He answered Habakkuk back after this complaint and he says, Write this vision. Write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he who runs will read it. And so you're going to write this plain. You're going to write this thing down. You're going to make sure that you communicate this. Habakkuk was told to write the vision down. He was going to make a record of it. He was going to put it, uh, the, the, the passage says, put it in tablets and in stones. And so he's going to write this thing down. He's going to receive this vision. He's going to write it down. And others are going to read it. And he's going to run with this message. You know what that tells me? Habakkuk was receiving a message, but it was a message not specifically for and to him. It had application to him, but it's not just about Habakkuk. He was going to share this message. He was going to tell others about this message. He was to write it down, and it was for an appointed time. You know, God's timing can be a fickle thing in our own minds and the sinfulness of the way we look at things. But God has a plan and a purpose. And he's a sovereign God who's in control. And he turns to Habakkuk and he says, listen, you don't understand this. I get it. You're frustrated. It doesn't make sense to me. But I want you to write it down and I want you to make it plain. Write it down. Be clear. Be concise. Because you're going to run with it. And you're going to spread this message. And you're going to tell others of this message. And of course, this has prophetic implications. He's a minor prophet, right? He's prophesying uh, to this nation of Judah. It has a lot to do with the Babylonians and the captivity that they're going to find themselves in. And by the way, Habakkuk actually seen in his life, he got to witness all the things that he prophesied about. They came true right there before his very eyes. And he says, you've got to prepare. You've got to tell the people. You've got to write it down, make it plain, and you've got to run with it. You can't hang on to this information. It's not something that you're to keep to yourself. You're to write it and to make it plain because they're going to experience these things and you're going to share this message with them. And so Habakkuk is in the process of recalculating all of this information. And that's what we see here in chapters 1 and in chapters 2 where here he is. He's trying to figure it all out. And he's at a point in his life where it's like, you know what? I don't get this. And I've got a mindset and a mentality that needs to be adjusted. And so when we think about this idea and understanding of recalculating, 
I want to make some personal applications for you and for me today. When we start looking at this idea and this example that we see in God's Word of a young man that's recalculating his own thought processes towards the plan and purpose of God, what do we do? How do we respond in situations and what, what can this mean for my life and how do I put this into principle and practical application? With this lesson and illustration that's seen for us in the Old Testament as it relates to this little nation of Judah and a young man named Habakkuk. So let me just give you three things. And the first thing I want to say to you is during these times of recalculating, when we're adjusting, one, we've got to stand watch. It's important for us to just stand watch. I want you to go back to chapter 2, verse number 1 for me. I told you we were going to come back to that. Listen to how chapter 2 opens up. Now remember, chapter 1 is all about this frustration and complaint and, and the command that he's given. And then he says in verse number 1 of chapter 2, I will stand my watch. I will set myself on a rampart to watch and to see what he will say to me. And I will answer when I am corrected. Habakkuk says, I'm going to stand watch. I've got to set myself as a stand. I've got to watch. I'm going to set myself apart. And I'm going to watch and I'm going to see. And I'm going to answer when I am corrected. Friends, listen, now's the time to stand watch. Now's the time more than ever to be looking for what God is doing. A watchman is one who stands and prepares and looks around and is observant and trying to figure out what's happening and, and what's taking place. Have you ever stopped during any of this 45 days plus to say, wait a minute, let me look around to see what God is doing. Let me look around to see how God is working and is there something happening that's around me that I can say, wait a minute, you know what? I see God moving in this area right here. And so Habakkuk says, I'm going to stand watch. I'm going to set myself as a rampart. I'm going to start looking and I'm going to be observant. And when I have the answer, I'm going to be corrected. When he shares this message with me, I'm going to stand corrected. I'm going to be obedient to him. And so friends, if you're going to recalculate your life, it's time to stand watch. It's time to be mindful that God is working and God is moving. But do you realize it? Do you see it? Are you looking and standing and waiting to see what God could be doing in this situation and circumstance? Maybe it means that you ask yourself what I can be doing in this situation and in these circumstances to be a blessing and a ministry to others around. And that'll never happen if you don't stand watch. That'll never happen if you don't focus on what God is doing and how you can be a part of God's plan to be a blessing to others that are around. And so stand watch, that's the first thing. The second thing I would tell you to do is run with God's message. Don't sit on what God is doing. When you see opportunities where there's a moment to bless, encourage others by saying, listen, man, I'm seeing God do something. Uh, I don't know about you, but God's working in my life and he's doing it in this way. I've been studying and searching the scriptures because I've got more time on my hands. And man, I feel closer to God now than I've ever been before. Begin to share this message. Begin to talk about the things that God's doing in your own personal life or the life of your family. And maybe it's time to make those adjustments and to recalculate in ways in which you can say, it's time for me to reach out and to be a blessing and a ministry to others. Now we, we focus so much on ourselves and the security and safety of ourselves that we stop to see the hurting people around us. That we stop to see the people that are in need. That we have a message and a message of hope. That this isn't the worst that God's going to bring us through this. And that there is a plan and a purpose. And no, we don't understand it. But I'm supposed to respond to God whether I understand or not. In an appropriate manner and in the right way. And so share this message. Share what God is doing. And reach out with kindness and love to those that are around us. And then the last thing we ought to be doing, this third thing, is that we ought to be praising God for what he is doing. Praising God. Have you ever stopped to just say, wait a minute, you know, this is really frustrating, but I'm just going to stop and look to see what God is doing. And when I see what God is doing, I'm going to praise him for being able to do that. I'm going to praise him for people who are willing to be obedient for him, to share God's message of love and of hope, and to be acts of kindness towards those that are around us, and praise God for those individuals. Praise God that we have people who are sincinuant and jeer in their, uh, and, and um, sincere in their faith and their walk with Him. That we want to reach out and share the love of Christ. In fact, really, we ought to be praising God during this time. And Habakkuk 
comes to that point. And if you move over to chapter number 3, you're really going to see Habakkuk's praise to God. In chapter 3, finally after all of this and his frustrations and seeing this dream, and by the way, he tells Habakkuk, the just shall live by his faith. You and I have to live by faith. And so finally he's praising God in verse number 17 of chapter 3. Though the fig tree may, be, uh, may not blossom nor fruit be on the vine, though the labor of the olive may fail, the field uh, yields no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, that there be no herd in the stalls. Yet, verse 18, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. He will, uh, he will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high heels and to the chief musicians and with the stringed instruments. You know, God, yes, Habakkuk said, you know what? I don't understand it. There's no figs on the trees. There's no food. We're struggling. We, we see all of these things happening. But yet I'm going to rejoice in the Lord and in the God of my salvation. I'm going to find a way to praise him. And you know the only way you're going to be able to do that? is when you learn to walk by faith. When you learn to recalculate your life and you learn to be able to say, you know what? God's wiser and more all-knowing than I am. And he has a plan and a purpose. And I'm just a part of that plan and purpose. And I don't have to know all of it. I don't have to have all the right answers. I don't have to understand everything that God's doing. But what I can do, even when I don't understand, is praise him. Is to glorify him. And to make sure I'm responding in an appropriate way. And so Habakkuk, after all of this, he says, wait, you know what? Yeah, if you're going to make it, the just shall live by faith. And that's what Habakkuk did. And in living by faith, we find himself, by the time this little book ends, praising the Lord, despite his lack of understanding or grasping all that God was going to do. He honored him. And that's what we ought to be doing during times like this. And so we ought to be assessing our priorities, which was we looked at last week with this recalculating. But now it's time to recalculate our mindset and to realize that, you know what, we're not going to have all the answers. Habakkuk didn't, and yet he still found a way to praise the Lord. And you and I should do the same. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you. Or for illustrations in your word like this, thank you that we get the opportunity to see uh, the pages of your word come to life in the accounts of history of men who were just like us, frustrated, confused, perplexed, uh, uncertain, and yet you challenged them to share that message. You challenged them to walk by faith, not by sight. You challenged them to praise you and to bring you glory and to honor. And so, Lord, we want to follow suit. We want to follow that example that we see time and time in Scripture. We want to honor you, even though we don't understand this even though it's hard and challenging and frustrating. Lord, we know you're in control, and we love you for that, and we're going to live our lives in the way you'd have us to live. We love you now and praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much uh, for being a part of our time and our service together. I want to bring a quick reminder to you, and that is that we are going to be opening up our services on Sunday morning. So May the 3rd, we're going to be back in just for our 1030 worship service. That's the only service that we're opening up uh, Sunday morning. Our young people will be able to meet on Sunday night. Uh, during their meetings as well on Sunday, May 3rd, as we start to progressively open up. You can check out our website for updates and information as we begin to launch our own reopening of the church uh, during the month of March and then moving into the summer months of June, July, and August. We hope you'll join us. Uh, you can subscribe to this uh, YouTube channel if you like the messages and want to continue to uh, see and get notifications for those. You can click that subscribe button. And then we look forward to seeing you in person on Sunday morning. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.